Hello everyone, happy Thursday. Welcome to Fertility Thursdays with NFI. I'm Dr. Cindy Duke, medical director and physician here at the Nevada Fertility Institute located in sunny Las Vegas, Nevada. Today, we will be talking about a very common form of fertility treatment known as intrauterine insemination. I hope to cover intrauterine insemination in terms of what is it, what uh, it's used for typically, and to answer as many questions as possible from our viewers. Um, again, today we're talking about intrauterine insemination, and I am Dr. Cindy Duke, medical director and physician here at the Nevada Fertility Institute. So we'll just get right into it. Uh, intrauterine insemination is a very common uh, treatment for infertility. Uh, as you may recall, we diagnose infertility based on two very simple criteria, which is for a woman, uh, and it's based on age. So a woman can have infertility if she's under age 35 and has been attempting to conceive. Uh, that is to say she's been having regular unprotected intercourse for at least 12 months. For a woman, if she's been doing that and not conceiving after a year of trying, then that is considered uh, infertility. If she's 35 years or older, then infertility is defined as having had unprotected intercourse for six months, regular unprotected intercourse for six months without successful pregnancy. That's considered infertility. And so one of the first line courses of treatment for infertility for women includes uh, intrauterine insemination. And uh, intrauterine insemination, we'll talk about what that is, how it works, and how we make it work. So the first thing is how it happens. So I'll go into how we determine who needs intrauterine insemination which people it may not work for at all, or it's not an option, and so forth. But simply put, let's first look at our trusty little model here, right? So remember, this is my uterus model. And in my uterus model here, uh, just to orient you again, this is the uterus, albeit my uterus has fibroids and polyps and endometriosis here. But it, assume it's a healthy uterus. It has two fallopian tubes, healthy fallopian tubes and the ovaries, right? So in a woman, if her fallopian tubes, at least one of them is open, if she ovulates regularly, or if a doctor helps her to ovulate, and if we have sperm that's of a good concentration, and we've talked about semen analyses before, we can actually work with that patient to perform intrauterine insemination. And simply put, intrauterine insemination involves the use of a catheter, and so it's sperm that's been washed. Um, we collect sperm from the partner or we get sperm from a donor. The sperm can be fresh semen that we wash and specially prepare, or it could be a uh, sperm that was frozen either from a partner or a donor. And uh, for example, if we got frozen sperm from a sperm bank and we take that, we prepare it, we wash it, and then we introduce it through the vagina into the uterus, and we go up to the top of the uterus with this catheter here that you're seeing, and that's insemination. We then introduce the sperm, the washed sperm, into the uterus. And so that's what intrauterine insemination literally means. It's the introduction of sperm insemination, into the uterus, right? And it's usually the upper part of the uterine cavity. And we release sperm there. By so doing, we actually shorten the distance that sperm have to travel to get across to the fallopian tube. Because as you remember, even though a baby grows here in the uterine cavity, pregnancy actually starts out here in the fallopian tube. This is where sperm and egg meet. And if they like each other, they start an embryo, and that embryo, five to seven days later, works its way down into the uterine cavity and implants. 
And so that's what intrauterine insemination is. Uh, in terms of importance, who might need it? So we determine who needs intrauterine insemination after a workup or an evaluation. And so, for example, if a patient shows up to me and they've come in complaining of infertility, meaning inability to get pregnant after trying for a year, uh, if she's under 35, if she's 35 and older, it's in inability to get pregnant after trying for six months, or if she's someone who's single or someone who is in a same-sex relationship, then we need sperm to achieve pregnancy. And so intrauterine insemination becomes necessary even before 12 or six months, depending on her age. For those patients, the first thing we have to do is make sure we know how her tubes are working. Because as you just saw, it's really important to be able to tell whether or not her um, fallopian tubes are open, seeing that sperm and egg actually meet in the fallopian tubes, right? And so that's the first thing uh, to figure out. Um, so we have a question here, and the question says, what does washing sperm mean? When you have regular sex, the sperm is just there, not washed. I'm curious. So that's a good question. So before we go back to talking about the evaluation for doing an intrauterine insemination, sperm washing refers to the process wherein in the specialized laboratory known as an andrology laboratory at the clinic, it could be at a fertility clinic, uh, some general OBGYN offices also have equipment to perform sperm washes, but it has to be done by someone who's been trained to wash the sperm. And basically what that means is when semen is ejaculated, it not only contains sperm, it contains a number of different proteins. Sometimes it contains antibodies, cells from the immune system. It contains sperm that's broken up and debris from the sperm. And so it's important in order to help uh, the sperm move during the insemination and to not introduce those things like the proteins that were in the semen, et cetera, into the uterus, because those can be quite um, irritating to the inside of the uterine cavity, we wash the sperm. So we collect it, we spin it down in a special centrifuge, and we take off the debris, just leaving the sperm back, and then we resuspend it. And maybe one day we'll look at how that's actually done in the laboratory. But then we have what we call washed, concentrated, sperm having removed all the other debris. The protein and so forth that's normally in semen, that's important for helping to neutralize the acidic pH of the vagina. That's why that's there. It's also there to help um, sperm just to keep them neutrified as they move through uh, the canal before they make their way into the uterus. And so with intercourse or sex and ejaculation sperm is semen is usually ejaculated into the vagina and then the sperm get caught up in special cervical mucus or what we call type 4 receptive mucus and then they some of them make their way out of the sperm the uh, excuse me out of the mucus and up into the uterus that's how it works usually after uh, intercourse. However, if we're not doing intercourse and we're doing insemination, intrauterine insemination, and that's important uh, to know because otherwise uh, some people can do insemination at home and that's known as intracervical insemination or ICI. And if you're someone who's ever gone to like the online sperm bank websites and looked up the different types of sperm available, you would have noticed that there is sperm available known as ICI sperm and sperm known as IUI sperm. The difference is that intracervical insemination or ICI sperm is sperm that has not been washed, whereas IUI sperm was already washed. Um, and so that's the difference in terms of how the sperm banks present sperm uh, for sale. Okay, so going back to what we were talking about, right, which is 
who needs IUI? So in terms of who needs intrauterine insemination, the key to know is that intrauterine insemination is such that in order for it to be safely performed, the fallopian tubes have to first be open. And so you need that HSG test that we've talked about before, the hysterosalpingogram, in order to safely achieve um, figure out whether the tubes are open and if they're open, which side, so that we can coordinate which month to do the insemination if only one tube is open, because it would make more sense to do the insemination during the month when the egg is being released from the side where the fallopian tube is open. Okay, uh, so some more things to talk about. So we talked about what IUI is, when is it commonly done, so as I mentioned, intrauterine insemination is one of the first line forms of treatment for uh, infertility. And so intrauterine insemination is typically performed uh, assuming and knowing that the tubes are open. It's performed in the cases of maybe, for example, a patient who does not have a male partner or is using frozen sperm specimens, then we have, when we thaw the sperm, it's such that we need to wash it and uh, introduce it into the uterus. If it's someone uh, who is perhaps the partner has sperm, but the sperm don't move as well, so they have what we call motility problems, meaning some of them move, but not a whole lot move, then if we at least have in excess of a million, we will consider doing insemination. Uh, but that, of course, will be following a discussion as to whether it makes sense to do IUI versus it makes more sense to go ahead and do IVF. Um, or ICSI, which is injection uh, of the egg with sperm. So going back to IUI, when is it done? It's typically one of the first line treatments. It's done for patients who either ovulate naturally on their own or for patients for whom we had to help them ovulate, i.e. do ovulation induction. Um, in terms of uh, safety, IUI is very safe, okay? I want everyone to remember that. It's very safe, but with a caveat. And that I would tie actually to a question that is actually showing up here, which was well-timed. So the question asks, you can do a home IUI. Doesn't that open the woman up to disease or infection? That's true, and I'll explain why. So home IUI, what does that mean? In its purest form, it's really not an IUI. So as I just explained, IUI is intrauterine insemination, meaning introduction of sperm into the uterus, okay? That's IUI. However, you can do what's known as ICI, or intracervical insemination at home, or what some women do, um, which is they get sperm that goes into a cup, and they leave it into the in the vagina here, one of those little intravaginal cups, and during their fertile window, and the sperm then makes its way up. That is performed, it's typically performed by uh, folks in certain communities or people with not easy access to a fertility specialist. What I would say is the key to know is part of the workup that we were talking about, the evaluation before deciding to do insemination, includes uh, screens for both the female patient and the male patient, even if it's a donor. And those screens include screens for sexually transmitted infections, such as syphilis, uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV. And so if you're someone who maybe has decided, I want to try to get pregnant, I am going to do a home insemination, a home intracervical insemination or using the cup, it's important to know that if this person was not screened for infectious diseases, you very well may be exposing yourself to infection. These infections are not only dangerous for you, the woman, but they can cause really bad birth defects in the baby if you got pregnant. So for example, if you were infected with syphilis, if you became infected with syphilis 
from uh, around the period, the time that you're attempting pregnancy or unfortunately from your donor, then you can not only develop syphilis yourself, but your baby as it's forming is exposed to syphilis, becomes infected and can end up with some really bad birth defects that can cause brain abnormalities, mental retardation, malformations in the ears, the eyes, etc. More importantly, uh, based on federal guidelines, we actually also screen for a few other infectious things, including a virus known as cytomegalovirus. CMV is one of the viruses that can cause mononucleosis, mono. If an adult is infected with it or a child, meaning a grown child, not a baby, it can actually cause mono to if you have an infection, but about 80% of us don't even know we've been exposed, but we've been exposed to CMV. 20% of us have not been. So that means if you're a woman who is actually CMV negative, meaning you, it turns out you haven't really been exposed to cytomegalovirus in your lifetime, but you get pregnant by say a donor who is cytomegalovirus positive, you can develop an infection right around the time that you become pregnant. Unfortunately, cytomegalovirus can cross the placenta infect your embryo or your developing fetus and cause some horrible birth defects. And so as a result, if you're a woman, especially one who is planning to use donor sperm, it's important to actually have some infectious disease screenings done, which include uh, having your partner screened or the donor screened. If you're in a same-sex couple, in addition to your sperm donor being screened for the a woman in a same-sex female relationship, her female partner should also be screened so that we at least have a full sense of what's going on. So those are some of the basic, basic things that have to be done before ideally an insemination is performed. Infectious disease screening, if you're using a donor, even if it's a donor that you know, he should also be screened. Just going by his word should not be enough. And that's in part because one, he may not know what he's been exposed to. Two, cytomegalovirus, many people are exposed in their childhood uh, in, in elementary school from sharing drinks with each other, etc. And so he may not even know if he's been exposed to cytomegalovirus and is cytomegalovirus positive, nor would you know for sure whether you, you are negative. And so it's worth getting tested and that's certainly part of the routine testing that we do here at Nevada Fertility Institute. We have another question here from Pina. And Pina says, do you use Clomid when doing IUI? You can. So not everyone uses Clomid, which is clomiphene citrate. It's the oldest approved uh, fertility drug out there. It's administered as a tablet, special tablets during a special part of the cycle, your, your menstrual cycle, the early part. And that's to help your ovaries develop eggs, usually one or two eggs for release. Uh, for some women, they will ovulate on their own once you give them clomiphene, meaning they will release an egg on their own. For others, they also need, in addition to clomiphene, after the follicles develop, meaning the eggs just getting ready for maturation, we have to give a special injection right when it's time so that the final maturation can happen with the egg, meaning making that egg receptive to fertilization, right? And so that shot is known as a trigger shot. It's a special injection. It also helps to time when egg release or ovulation will happen. And so if we're doing insemination, we time it very specific to that egg release based on when we knew we gave the shot initially. Some people do insemination based on their ovulation kit. So they monitor, they do home monitoring for when they might be ovulating, okay? For many women, uh, the way we recommend it is if you have natural, regular cycles, they're very predictable, they're not all over the place, then you probably have regular cycles, meaning you ovulate regularly. And so you can use an ovulation predictor kit. Ovulation predictor kits are sold at pharmacies, at Target, at the dollar store, online. 
and they range from very simple ones where you can just dip it into your urine, first urine from the morning when you wake up, first void, and you look for a color change. If there's a color change, you call up your clinic and they will help schedule you for your IUI. If you're someone using one of the more fancy ones, then you're looking for when the solid, the smiley face that's flashing goes solid. And so that's something to know about. Another question from Pina says, do you need to be on any shot to do an IUI? And the answer is you do not need to be on any shots depending on the patient. Some patients need to be on injections. So for example, if you're one of those patients um, who doesn't ovulate regularly, especially if you're one of those patients for whom your inability to ovulate is due to a breakdown in the messaging that goes from your brain to your ovary. So as you may remember, we talked about people on the extremes of weight. And if you're someone who, because you're low body weight or history of very intense exercise or anorexia or bulimia, it may have caused your brain to shut down how it messages and controls your ovaries release of eggs. And so in that case, you may need medications which are FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, um, and LH some, most times, luteinizing hormone to help you release an egg. And that's, that is very much a complicated drug that has to be managed by someone who is trained to do so. Someone such as me, like a fertility specialist. And so I want you to consider that. If you need that, it's determined by your doctor. Another group of women who may need injectable medications and not tablets would be uh, women with really severe or resistant polycystic ovary syndrome such that they do not respond to clomiphene or to Femara, letrozole, which is another type of oral medication. And how would your doctor know if you're responding, by the way, to these medicines? Well, they perform ultrasounds to follow the ovaries to see if they're responding and developing a follicle. And they perform blood work to see if your estrogen levels are changing, i.e. is your estrogen rising as you start developing an egg. Okay, uh, other questions. <clears throat> so we have one here that says, are there supplements or any special diet to help the process? So this question has to do with what can I do to increase my chances of getting pregnant, of conceiving? And for anyone who's planning to get pregnant, I certainly recommend a prenatal vitamin. Prenatal vitamins, as I tell all my patients, I don't have a preference in the brand or anything. And that's in part because prenatal vitamins have to have a minimum number of those specific nutrients and vitamins which are required for a healthy growth of babies. And so prenatal vitamins would always have folic acid and they will always have at least 400 micrograms of folic acid. For special groups of women, they may need more folic acid than that, but your doctor will guide you based on your specific medical history and maybe the need for more folic acid. Uh, prenatal vitamins have all those things. If you're an older woman, especially if you're age 35 and older, I would also recommend using um, CoQ10 or Coenzyme Q10. It's a special uh, vitamin, it's an antioxidant that's been shown to aid and facilitate the uh, let's call it the almost it's like caffeine for eggs. It helps to boost how your eggs perform and how they perform once they've been fertilized by sperm. Uh, for some women, a few other very special supplements help them, like inositol helps women who are truly polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS. Taking 2,000 milligrams of myo-inositol daily helps. Uh, in women who have... Uh, diminished ovarian reserve or lowered ovarian number. There are some other medications, um, supplements that may help, but I have to be very honest here to say that if you're someone diagnosed with diminished ovarian reserve, intrauterine insemination may not be the best step for you because the chance of pregnancy may be so low that Comparing that versus the amount of eggs you have left, IVF may actually make more sense for you, especially if your goal is to have multiple children going forward. 
Uh, we have a question from Rita. Hi, Rita. And Rita's question is, do you ever use Gonolef or injectable medications for IUI? And yes, Rita, we do. That's actually the answer I was giving a little bit earlier, which is, do we ever use any medications and do we use injections? And the answer is yes. So Gonolef is a brand. It's a brand name for a form of FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. There are two types of uh, follicle stimulating hormone on the market that are just FSH. One is known as Gonolef. The other one in the United States, that is. The other one is known as Folistim. They're the same active ingredient, just marketed by two different companies. Uh, we also use one called Menopure, and that has FSH and LH in it. And that's important for use in certain patients, especially patients such as the ones who don't typically make their own FSH, don't typically make their own LH, and they need a little bit of both. Uh, more questions. Another question asks, can you have sex if you're also doing IUI? Yes. And so let's talk a little bit about what's known as the fertile window for a woman. So if you're a woman who ovulates regularly, you actually have a certain stage in your menstrual cycle where you're most fertile. And for if you're just at home and you want to know how you figure out your fertile window, there are certainly applications you can use. There are different apps where you can put in your start and end of your period. And after a couple months, the app is able to help you predict your fertile window. Uh, for some women, they prefer to actually check. And so you can do a check of your cervical mucus. And so the way you check cervical mucus is you need to know what the differences are. So cervical mucus doesn't mean putting your hand in your vagina or anything like that. It simply means being able to tell the difference with your vaginal discharge. And believe it or not, your vaginal discharge changes over the course of your menstrual cycle such that in the days right after your period ends, you have a certain type of discharge. And that's sort of, it's not much, you just feel dry, there's nothing coming out. And about a week after your period ends, that discharge turns into feeling sort of damp, moist, um, and it's sort of clear, right? Then you get to that third time, which is a time right before your fertile window, and your discharge gets really thick, creamy, and sort of chunky. It may even be yellow, white colored. It's usually white, but sometimes it's yellowish colored. And then just as you're approaching the point where ovulation is going to happen, meaning as you're entering the point of peak fertility, or as you're entering your fertile window, the discharge changes to this very transparent, very much like egg white stretchy discharge. So you can actually, if you use a mirror, you can see that. And if you touch it, you'll actually see that the discharge is a little stretchy. That is your fertile window. And so certainly if you're having sex during that time, every other day, that helps. If you're also doing insemination, let's say we're doing one of those cycles where you have access to a partner, you're having sex, then you want to have sex. Usually, let's say if we gave you that shot to help you release the egg. On the night of that special injection, we also advise you to have sex. And then about 36 hours later, we perform the insemination. Another question. Apologies if inappropriate. I was told that I should try the orgasm 15 minutes before an IUI. Is this true? Well, let's think about that, right? So what does orgasm mean? Well, orgasm is actually a physical thing wherein when you orgasm, there are muscles around the uterus that actually lift up the uterus and it lifts up the cervix so that there are waves that happen, muscular contractions, but they're upward contractions. And so orgasm actually helps, but it might actually help more after ejaculation, not before. And that's because if there's sperm here and they're caught up in an orgasm, they're actually going to be lifted upward. They're waved up into the uterus. And so that's how orgasm works. It's apart from it being pleasurable, it's actually intended to physiologically facilitate the movement of sperm upward. That's the biology behind orgasm other than how you feel. Okay. Uh, other questions. I love this, guys. This is super interactive. Okay. The other question says, what is the success rate for an IUI versus 
in vitro fertilization or the cervical IUI approach. I have to be honest with you, it varies, and that's because there are other factors that help us determine success of an IUI. And so the success of an IUI is dependent on not just how we do the IUI, the insemination, but it's dependent on the age of the woman, um, meaning the age of her eggs determines how successful uh, the chance for fertilization would be, uh, how many eggs she has remaining is a factor, uh, the quality of the sperm is a factor. The number of eggs potentially released uh, can impact that a little bit, but that impacts more her chances for multiple babies, not the chance of getting pregnant. Um, so those are all things that we need to keep in mind and be aware of. Um, but the general numbers that we quote are, so let's say, for example, we're dealing with a 25-year-old, for example, who is attempting to conceive, she has no medical problem. She has what we call unexplained infertility, meaning her tubes are open on HSG and they spilled just fine. A uh, partner has good semen analysis, making lots of sperm, lots of millions of sperm. Um, she ovulates regularly. Uh, she responds well to uh, the medications for ovulation induction if we did that. Her lining thickened nicely and was receptive. In a patient like that, her chance for pregnancy with Clomid is probably between 12 and 15%. If she's doing injectable medications, it may be as high as 18% chance of success, averaged out over doing it three times, okay? So that's talking about a 25-year-old healthy and otherwise no medical issues, just unexplained infertility. That is compared to say a 41 or 42 year old woman who is also healthy, but is now 42, so her eggs are 42, what are her chances of success? It may not be any higher than four to 6% chance of success from IUI um, versus her IVF chances, which would be significantly higher and could be as high as 20, 30% simply doing IVF at 40, 41, compared to doing insemination at age 40, age 41. So those are the big differences, guys. And of course, with IUI, it takes multiple rounds. So knowing that, that chance of success, I always like to tell patients, also think of success, and I know nobody wants to hear this, but think of the flip side to that, right? So if I tell you that your chance of success from IUI is 15%, it means the chance of it not working is 85%. That said, also remember what we talked about in our very first Facebook Live last year in um, January. I can't believe it's been a year, guys. Um, remember that the natural chances of getting pregnant or what we call fecundability for a woman, a young woman, unprotected intercourse, otherwise healthy for a year is 20 to 22 percent. So a chance of 15 percent of insemination after having tried for a year, for example, and where it should have been 22 percent, but you didn't get pregnant at all, insemination with ovulation induction, bringing it to 15 percent is not bad compared to natural chances of conception, okay? But yes, IVF across practically every age group has higher chances of pregnancy compared to IUI. Okay, another question, this is great. So this question says, I have been diagnosed with low sperm count. I was told IVF only option, but that we could try IUI. Is IUI really a good option for us or the IVF? Well, again, based on what I just told you, IVF is probably always the best option for your chances of success. However, uh, there are many reasons why someone may do IUI before IVF, depending on what their true sperm parameters are, what the findings were on semen analysis. But uh, for some patients, while they want to do IVF, it may not be financially possible for them at that point. And so intrauterine insemination may be the path they choose, even though they find out that the chances for success are significantly lower, they may prefer to do that as opposed to not being able to do IVF and just not get pregnant at all. 
Uh, for some patients, if their insurance covers IVF, the insurance may require that you do insemination and prove that it doesn't work before you can do in vitro fertilization IVF. Um, and so those might be big reasons. Uh, for some people, religious beliefs would prevent them from doing IVF, but they're willing and religiously feel like it's permitted to do intrauterine insemination. And so those might be reasons why someone would still choose to do IUI even if they were recommended for IVF. Now, who are the patients who absolutely cannot do IUI, meaning it does not make sense because it does not change your chances, it's gonna be zero? Well, if you're someone who's had tubal ligation, meaning both your tubes are now cut and they're no longer connected, then IUI is not an option for you. You can't do IUI if your tubes are completely ligated. They're, they're not gonna work. Because remember, in order for IUI to work, even though baby grows here, it starts out here in the tubes, right? If you have a history of pelvic inflammatory disease or on HSG, they saw that both of your fallopian tubes were blocked. You're also not a candidate for IUI or insemination, right? If you are a man who had a semen analysis that showed very low sperm count, very few or no sperm moving, then you're also not a candidate for insemination, okay? So those are some of the more obvious reasons for people who would not be candidates for insemination. Uh, other questions here. Does insurance generally cover IUI? And the answer is sometimes. Uh, here in Las Vegas, a lot of the insurances provide coverage for insemination or IUI. It really depends on the type of the insurance that you have. It depends on the policy that you have. What I would certainly encourage any patient to do is if you're considering seeking care with a fertility specialist, while you're planning to go see that doctor, one of the first things you can do is call up your insurance and find out what your benefits are. Ask them whether they provide uh, diagnostic coverage, meaning do they cover the testing for infertility, like the hysterosalpingograms, the ultrasound, the blood work, the visit with the doctor. But also, uh, they you can ask them whether or not it will cover things like intrauterine insemination, which is treatment, or IVF, in vitro fertilization, and everything else that that entails. Question from an email. How does the process for the man sperm donor work. How do you collect and wash day of the IUI or before? So that depends, right? If you are using sperm from a sperm bank, that sperm was collected at least six months ago. And that's because all sperm banks in the United States are governed by the FDA, the Federal, uh, the Food and Drug Administration. And the FDA has rules and regulations about use of donated tissue or sperm or eggs in the United States. So in the case of sperm, if a man expresses interest in becoming a sperm donor, and these are usually anonymous sperm donors, he goes to a sperm bank, he tells them his interest, they do questionnaires, they take his medical history and all that good stuff, but they also do testing. Remember we talked about the tests that are recommended. So the sperm banks would do HIV testing, hepatitis testing, gonorrhea, chlamydia testing, uh, syphilis testing, and that cytomegalovirus testing that we talked about. They do all of that and they send it off. And if he tests negative, then he, he, and they do a semen analysis to make sure he's making a good sperm quality and count. If it is, then he becomes eligible to donate sperm. And they have him donate sperm and they freeze it. And they keep it frozen for six months. And that's called quarantine, okay? The sperm stays in quarantine. And six months after he first donated that sperm, he has to come back to that clinic and they test him again for HIV, hepatitis B and C, uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and cytomegalovirus. Um, actually, they don't repeat the cytomegalovirus. I take that back. They do the other five things. 
And that's to make sure that he didn't become positive for either HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, syphilis, or gonorrhea, chlamydia in the six months since they got his sperm. If he tests negative then, now they've got at least two negative tests of showing that over six months, he's been negative. He didn't suddenly become positive for these things or become what we call seropositive, seroconvert. And then they make his sperm available. Now, that's important to know, guys, because for example, you know, Valentine's is coming up. Even if you met someone and you've fallen in love and you both got tested for HIV and you're both negative today, a negative test today doesn't mean that you may not be already be HIV positive. What that means is that your body's immune system hasn't what we call zero converted, meaning it has not started making the antibodies that show HIV is in your system. HIV can actually be in your system for up to 12 weeks. That is three months. HIV can already be infecting your body for three months before you're finally positive on an HIV antibody test. And so it's important to know that, and it's based on that knowledge why sperm banks have to wait six whole months before they can release sperm, even though he's collected it six months ago. They have to confirm that since ever since the time this guy gave sperm up until now, he has not converted, All right? So that's important to know. Uh, next question. Oh, that, there's actually another part to that question, which was how do you collect and wash on the day of the IUI or before? So we, uh, if it's fresh semen and we prefer that when we can get it, we collect it on the day of about an hour to an hour and a half before the time for the insemination. And that's because it takes between one hour to 90 minutes to really wash sperm, that washing, the spinning, the resuspending, all that stuff. Right, so we do that. Um, let's see if there are any other questions that I have not gone through yet. So uh, Rita said, sorry if this has already been addressed. For someone with PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, what is your preferred medication for IUI? Well, Rita, uh, it depends on the patient, but the options are Clomid or Clomiphene citrate, Letrozole or Fomara, although I have to be honest with you, there's quite a bit of data that suggests Letrozole, Fomara is better for PCOS patients than is Clomid. And then third would be injectables, uh, which would be like you had asked Gonolef, which is FSH or Folistim, they're all the same, or Menopure. And so I don't have one preferred medication and that's in part because each patient's different. I really treat my patients as individuals, so I look at their whole history, their whole person, look at what their other medical issues may be, and I tailor their treatment based on the need for them. So it's not cookie cutter, and truly, in the world of infertility, as with any other form of medicine, it cannot be cookie cutter. So it's based on how the patient, uh, what her system is telling me, I interpret that. Um, question here, let's make sure we've gone through all of them. Uh, in, does insurance generally cover IUI? We already answered that. Um, let's see, I think we've gone through most all of those questions unless there's another one that I'm missing. I don't see them and our moderator hasn't highlighted any other ones. Uh, let's just make sure I've gone through all of my questions, okay? So I'm just looking through to make sure there aren't any other questions that I have. But I think we've answered all of them. You know, how do I know if I need insemination was a question I anticipated. And so uh, certainly if you have any other questions, feel free to email. I will certainly answer those. If you uh, post a comment, even after we've stopped going live, I will come in and answer those or send you a private message as needed. Or oh, our moderator will facilitate an answer. Uh, next week is Valentine's Day, and so uh, we're eager to see how everybody's doing. Uh, we certainly have had a few offers that we can share, and I think uh, you would see that from time to time. Again, uh, this is Dr. Cindy Duke from Nevada Fertility Institute here in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, sharing some information. I love drop in knowledge, and uh, that's what we're here to do. So send us your questions. We have, a, like I mentioned, a number of cool topics coming up 
this year. We've made our one year anniversary of doing Fertility Thursdays. And we even have some really interesting guests coming up. And I think you guys would appreciate that um, when we get to it. So until then, have a good night. And we will see you next two weeks from now. Bye-bye.